Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We have a very full house and a very great evening planned in store for you to this evening. Uh, my name is Joan Gully. I have the great privilege of chairing the Board of Trustees of the Nantucket Athenaeum. And we are very delighted that you have joined us this meeting uh, this evening for the final lecture for 2018 in the Geshki Lecture Series. We are deeply grateful to Nan and Chuck Geshki for their generous support, which makes this lecture series possible. Thank you very much. As I said, we have a great evening in store for you. Our speaker, Ambassador Nicholas Burns, is one of the country's most experienced and most articulate spokespeople on globalization and US foreign policy. He is currently Professor of Diplomacy and International Relations at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Prior to his academic career, Ambassador Burns served in the United States government for 27 years. He played a leadership role in US foreign policy toward the Middle East and Asia, and was the nation's top career diplomat as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs from 2005 to 2008. Before serving as Under Secretary, Ambassador Burns worked for five years on the National Security Council at the White House. He also served as the State Department spokesman, ambassador to Greece, and ambassador to NATO, where he led efforts to secure support for the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. He has a very long resume, a very long list of awards, honorary degrees, and so forth. He writes a regular column for, the, for foreign affairs for the Boston Globe, and he is a diehard Red Sox fan, so he is uh, in good company here. I could continue to list his achievements, but I know you want to listen to him rather than me. So please turn off your cell phones, and please join me in welcoming Ambassador Burns to the podium. Thank you very much. Joan, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you to the Nantucket Athenaeum for this great welcome to my wife, Libby, and me. Libby's right here in the front row. We came over this morning on the ferry from New Bedford. We have a house on the opposite side of the water in Westport, Massachusetts. Uh, Libby, we were trying to think when the last time we were here. Libby was last year in college. Um, I was last here 52 years ago. As a little kid with my mom and dad and my brothers, Nantucket was a little bit different 52 years ago than it is today, but very beautiful. We're really pleased to be here. Thank you to the Geshkis for sponsoring this great lecture series. Some of you will have heard my colleague, John Holdren at Harvard University. We work on the same floor. My good friend, General Dave Petraeus, I admire him very much. I know he spoke last Thursday uh, at the Athenaeum. So I feel like I'm in good company. Um, here's what I wanna do tonight. Let's talk about the United States of America, our role in the world, where we're going as a country, what we need to do to keep our country great. I think President Trump is right. We are great. We have always been great since the Second World War. We need to retain that greatness. Uh, I was really pleased uh, before we started tonight that a distinguished um, former Prime Minister of Canada, Prime Minister Joe Clark, uh, came up and we had a nice talk. He's seated right in the back row. So if I get in there, I want to salute him. And may I say, this is a time when all Americans should show a little kindness and love towards the Canadians, because they're a great neighbor of the United States of America. I'm looking forward to your questions, comments. I, I teach now for a living. I tell my students, please disagree with me. And so please disagree with me tonight. And if you disagree, just let me know in the Q&A session and we'll, um, we'll talk about the issues. Um, I'm gonna show some slides, but it's not gonna be death by PowerPoint. I promise you that. Uh, I taught a course at Harvard. I've taught a course called Great Powers. Over the last four or five years, I just finished the course in early May. I had 75 unbelievably smart students from 23 countries. We were a mini United Nations. We were from all over the world. And we had three objectives in this course. We're looking at the present international scene. Objective number one, who's waxing and who's waning? Who's rising as a power? Who's more influential? And which countries are losing a little bit of their, uh, of their fastball, as we say, as Red Sox fans? Question number two, which is an important question as we think about our kids 
and our grandchildren and think about the challenges that we're leaving them, how can these countries with capacity, China, India, Indonesia, Russia, the European Union, Nigeria, South Africa, Brazil, Colombia, Canada, the United States of America, how do we link arms and solve problems together? Climate change being the number one problem for my millennial students, and I'm a climate change acceptor, not a climate change denier. How do 195 countries in the UN system join forces to mitigate the worst aspects of climate, bring our carbon emissions down, try to arrest some of what John Holdren told you, these extraordinarily destructive uh, tendencies that we've let loose in the world. How do we stop war? How do we deal with pandemics? How do we stop the trafficking of women and children? All these problems are connected in academia. We give them a fancy word. They're transnational problems. All that means is they affect 7.6 billion people in the world in 195 nation states, all of us, and even the most powerful country in the world, and I think by any measure we are still the most powerful country, can't begin to address any of them if we're not linking our efforts with those of other countries around the world. That's why the 21st century, particularly the world we give to our kids and grandchildren, is gonna be fundamentally different than the last couple of centuries. Nation states could go it alone for most of human history, no longer with a degree of economic and societal and technological interdependence. So the key is, how do we work with each other? That was the second question. And the third question we tried to answer in class is a big one. How do we avoid the worst? How do we avoid a World War III? How do we avoid loosening the genies of technology that could be destructive, unleashing pathogens, misusing for evil purposes artificial intelligence, which I'm sure both John Holdren and Dave Petraeus talked to you about if you were there for both of their lectures. So we had a tremendous semester. I learned so much from these young people. They're so smart. I have confidence in this generation. We have three millennial daughters, and I think their generation is willing to take on these problems. They need a little bit of the wisdom and experience that maybe a lot of us in this room above a certain age bring, but they're ready to lead. And so what I thought I'd do is take that three and a half month course and condense it into six slides. <laughs> forgive the simplicity, forgive the simplicity. What I thought we'd do is take a race around the world. And what I wanna do is start with where we ended in class. I asked the students at the end of class, okay, we've been thinking analytically about this world of ours over the last three and a half months. Tell me where the big economic, technological, political, and military trend lines are, positive and negative. I'm gonna start with a slide called Megatrends where we think, in my class, my students, the world is heading. It's not always pretty, by the way, so fasten your seatbelts. Secondly, uh, for the purposes of time, I just selected three continents. What's happening in Europe? What's happening in Europe that's gonna profoundly change Europe and that could have a big impact on us? What has been happening in the Middle East? And then finally, the Indo-Pacific, because I think that's gonna be the most consequential part of the world. In my class, we look at Latin America and Africa. This is not a three and a half month lecture. This is uh, till 9.15 tonight, so I'm just gonna shorten it a bit. We're gonna end with two slides. One is gonna show Prime Minister Clark's country and our country and Mexico, that virtuous North American Union that we should be celebrating and constructing, not dismantling in my view. And the last slide is gonna be hope, because I need to leave you with hope. So here goes, and I'm gonna move around just a little bit. I hope all of you can see these slides. We actually tested it a little bit earlier. Um, megatrends, so what do we think are the big trends that we have to appreciate positive and negative about the world. Um, here's what my students and I concluded. Number one, we are in a virtuous economic cycle right now. It may not last forever. I was reading the New York Times this morning. It may not last to the end of the year, who knows? There are people in this audience who might have a much better grasp on that from the financial community than I would. But right now, all major economies are in positive growth. We haven't been there for 12 years. India is gonna grow by 7.5% this year, which is extraordinary. India, by the way, amazing country, I go there two or three times a year, will have the largest global economy by the end of this century, unless there are path-breaking breakthroughs in medical science, none of us will be here. 
but our kids, our grandchildren will. And by the end of this century, India is going to be the dominant economy. There's no question about it. Given demographics and given their technological and science and technology base. China is growing somewhere in the 6% uh, region. We, don't, we never know about Chinese data because the Communist Party inflates it. But it's still an expanding, booming economy. The United States of America, our last quarterly growth rate, 4.1%. We've done very well under two presidents, Barack Obama and Donald Trump. So in a way, this can be, they should take bipartisan credit. We really rarely do that these days in the United States, but all economies in positive economic growth. The balance of powers in flux, everybody knows that. For the last 73 years, since the end of the Second World War, the United States has been the undisputed heavyweight global superpower. We had a four and a half decade struggle with the Soviet Union. It was really over nuclear weapons supremacy in the space program. They never matched us economically, and they never could at, match us economically. But right now, we're entering a couple of decades. For the next 20 to 30 years, we're, we're probably going to see the biggest change in the balance of who has power in the world. How do we measure power? Who has economic weight? Who has military reach and power? Who has political influence? And who has kind of cultural soft power, as my colleague at Harvard, Joe Nye, says, the ability to influence by our culture? In our case, Amazon, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Hollywood, um, the First Amendment to the Constitution, Martin Luther King. Libby and I have lived in six countries together over the last uh, 42 years. And um, when I travel around the world, people are impressed by our technological base, by our constitution as amended, and the Bill of Rights, and by our redemptive quality. quality. The fact that we could, Martin Luther King led us to fix the original sin of the constitution, that African Americans were three-fifths of a citizen. If you come from a place where there are minority rights problems, disaffected populations, people who think they don't have a chance because of their religion or their ethnicity or the color of their skin, they look at us and they say, look what they did. After two, or several hundred years of getting it wrong, they decided to fix the problem. It's not fixed yet. We know it's not fixed yet, but at least we have a great American who took us a long way. So that's part of our soft power. So if you think about the balance of power, how about that? Now, when I say a weakening America, I'm not saying America's weak, because America's not weak. Largest economy, most innovative economy, our greatest strengths are in biotechnology, nanotechnology, the information revolution led by California, and with an assist from Austin and Raleigh, Durham, and Boston, and lots of Pittsburgh, and lots of other places. We have enormous economic power especially in the knowledge economy of the future. Militarily, right now, although the gap is closing, nobody can approximate us in power. So we're not weak in absolute terms, but in relative terms, India is gaining on us. And certainly, China is, people say that China's rising to power. It's probably not the right word. China's returning to power. Because for 18 of the last 20 centuries, China's been the dominant global economy. For 18 of the last 20 centuries, China has been the dominant global economy because it's positioned geographically, because of its population base, because of its knowledge base. And they're returning after two centuries of exploitation by the West to their natural weight in the global economy. Um, Europe is strengthening in many ways relative to the United States. It might surprise some people to say that. Nigeria's population is going to double in the next 40 years. Nigeria, given its resource base, if it can resolve its political and corruption problems, could become one of the dominant global societies when our grandchildren are running the world. So tremendous changes underway after a relatively placid, static, seven decades where the United States was singularly in charge. We're now entering a period where we're first among equals, but we have to learn to share power. And when I worked for President Carter, that wasn't so clear at the beginning of my career. I think it was clear to Bill Clinton and George W. Bush 
and Barack Obama. They started to think more of their time had to be spent not just telling people what to do, but creating these coalitions on climate change, stopping wars, on other social issues. So we'll have to see more of that. For the next 10 to 20 years, Putin's only 64 years old. And he regularly shows us how strong he is. You know, takes off his shirt and wrestles Siberian tigers. He's probably president for life. We're going to be dealing with an authoritarian Russia. And that's going to be another battle for us. We're stronger, but he's aggressive. And I'll say a word about that in a minute. Xi Jinping, same age, 64 years of age. Probably now the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao. More powerful than Deng Xiaoping, who made China in its modern incarnation. If you read his three and a half hour long speech at the 19th Party Congress last October, it's a long speech, I made my students read it. He says a lot of, he's a very smart man. He's a very wise leader in many ways. He's tough. He's centralizing power in the Communist Party. He's cracking down on individual liberties even more than his predecessors did. He said in that speech, China is going to become the dominant power in Asia. Now, we Americans have been the dominant power in Asia since the Japanese surrendered in Tokyo Bay on September 2nd, 1945. There's a competition underway. There is a big competition underway for power between the United States and both of those countries. The European strong, largest global economy, by the way, is the EU. 500 million people are NATO allies, but they're inward looking because we were talking at dinner. They have a euro. They have a currency with no fiscal union behind it. There's never been a stable currency in the modern times that didn't have fiscal stability, central fiscal power behind it. The Europeans are going to have to figure out how to centralize more power in Brussels. The people don't want to do that. I think that's the biggest problem, along with record-setting immigration, not just from the Levant, from the wars in Syria and Iraq, but south-north, from North Africa, West Africa, and Central Africa, historic numbers of people, not so much refugees fleeing war, economic migrants making rational decisions. The jobs are more plentiful in Europe than they are in Tunisia or Nigeria or Egypt. So the Europeans contending with a lot. Um, a big power shift to the Indo-Pacific. I'll show you a map of the Indo-Pacific, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, and the Pacific Ocean. Um, and then the rise of, um, of nationalism. Nationalism is not patriotism. I think most countries are have a lot of patriotism. We do. We love our country. I saw about a million American flags. We did as Libby and I walked around this unbelievably beautiful place uh, today, and that's wonderful. We prize patriotism. Nationalism has a little got an edge to it. We're better than you. In fact, we're so much better than you, we might want to dominate you. That's how the Chinese feel about the five other countries contesting territorial claims in the South and East China Seas. It's definitely the way that Putin feels. Let me give this side of the room a little attention. Uh, in Eastern Europe, Putin believes that those smaller countries, because they're not as powerful militarily, well, maybe I have a right to some of their land. We're seeing historic rise in nationalism, almost chauvinism in China under Xi Jinping. It's got a dangerous quality to it. It needs to be watched. In India, a little bit different. Narendra Modi, pro-business. He's a Hindu nationalist. One of the great glories of India has been it's, it's multi-religious. India has the second largest Muslim population in the world. Second largest, Indonesia is the largest. India has more Muslims than Pakistan or Malaysia. Um, and so that balance between Hindu and Muslim is being upset by this Hindu nationalist, Prime Minister Narendra Modi. We've talked about Russia, Prime Minister Abe in Japan, a nationalist, and I would say this. I think we've entered a strange, there's a strange period right now that we've entered a nationalism. Uh, even if you're a Trump supporter, you might have to wonder about America first, which, you know, if you look back to the late 1930s, one of the, mo one of the least fortunate and least wise and most mistaken movements we've ever had, keep the United States out of the war, have the United States not go to the defense of Britain and France in 1939 and 19. 19 
40. The rise of nationalism has to be watched. The rise of anti-democratic populism. I've been in five European countries this summer, and I can tell you what the Europeans are most concerned about, that there's a cancer in their societies of right-wing and left-wing, but mainly right-wing, anti-democratic populists who don't believe in civil freedoms, who may not believe that people should rule at the ballot box. And they're governing in Hungary, they're governing in Poland, they're in the government of Italy, and they're contesting elections in France and Germany and the Netherlands and other places, and we aren't helping them. In fact, at key moments of the last year, we, our government has swung a support for the authoritarian powers in Hungary and Poland against the democratic powers. So watch that space as well. This is really interesting and really harrowing. I spent last weekend in Aspen, Colorado. I direct a group called the Aspen Strategy Group. We are nonpartisan. We bring Madeleine Albright and Condoleezza Rice into the same discussion over three days, uh, Republicans and Democrats. And last week, our topic was, how might the coming age of vast technological growth and a lot of technologists, we've got one sitting right here in the front row, believe that the tech changes over the next 30 to 40 years could exceed in importance and depth the tech changes of the last 35 years. If you think about artificial intelligence, quantum computing, biotechnology. We had experts come in from all the major tech companies and universities. And my takeaway was the United States has led militarily because since 1943, 44, we have always had the technological lead over all of our foes. We may, we risk losing it to China in the competition in artificial intelligence specifically as it's applied to military technology and quantum computing. Again, we were talking at dinner. Think of our aircraft carriers and destroyers, the battle groups that we've formed in the Mediterranean, and especially in East Asia. They have been the dominant projections of American military power for two generations. With space-based um, sensors right now, we can't hide those ships. An F-35, our unbelievably expensive new top-ranked fighter airplane, these technologies could be outmoded, sitting ducks in 10 to 15 years as an entirely new generation of military technology develops in these fields. And right now, the Chinese are putting 10 times as much public R&D money into this than we are. A lot of our R&D is in private companies, being well spent by those companies, but we are underfunding research and development in our universities. So my students and I are very concerned about this trend line. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Joe Dunford, who grew up in Brighton, Massachusetts, issued a statement this past year saying, we are risking our military superiority to China. Eric Lander, who directs the Broad Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, same thing. Unless we go back to what Walter Isaacson, who also was with us in Aspen, says the virtuous innovation triangle what made America great technologically over the last 70 years? Government research, private companies, and universities in a virtuous effort together, supporting each other. Right now we have an unbalanced triangle where the private companies have a lot of money. And the universities, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, Caltech, MIT, Harvard, a lot of money in those endowments to propel scientific research. Government being starved. So how do you take the leading technological growth in quantum computing, and how does, how does the US government take advantage of that at a time when Apple won't talk to the FBI? When for the first time the tech companies don't want to be in union with the government? That wasn't the case during the Manhattan Project. That wasn't the case when we put 14 million people into uniform in World War II. We had a virtuous union. It's disappeared. And our greatest experts told us that last weekend. Um, last megatrend. Despite Korea, Vietnam, Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Iraq, the wars we fought since the greatest generation won World War II, we have had a great power peace uh, over the last 73 years. Let me just give you two data points to describe what that means. Uh, we're commemorating the end of the First World War this summer. And this autumn, Libby and I went out to trace the footsteps of her great uncle who fought as part of the American Expeditionary Force in 1918. 
We had 450,000 American soldiers fighting in France in 1918. The dead of the First World War conservatively estimated at about 17 million people between August, July 1914 and November 1918. Seven, uh, 17 million people died. In the Second World War, if you date it from the Japanese invasion of, um, of China, of Nanjing in 1937, and then the end of the war in Japan and Asia in September 1945, the end of the war in Europe in May 1945, over 60 million, six zero, dead. 20 million of whom were Soviet citizens. No country in the history of the world has ever suffered anything remotely on the scale of what the Soviets suffered. One of the great glories of the last 73 years is we've never had to fight that kind of war. And think of our technology. Think of chemical warfare that we have unfortunately now perfected. And we've seen Assad use it multiple times against his own people. Think of biological weapons and the absolute mayhem and destruction that could be caused by an evil government or an evil person or a terrorist group that wanted to unleash pathogens in our society. Think of nuclear weapons destruction. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, October 1962, the closest we've ever come to a nuclear war, Kennedy asked his advisors, that 17, it was all men, committee, what will happen, he said, if we get into a shooting war, exchange of nuclear weapons, how many people will die? And no one knew. But after the fact, a lot of people looked at that question, maybe 100 million people would have died. Between the Ural Mountains, and the Rocky Mountains. You know, a lot of people would have died instantaneously if you're near a detonation point, and then a lot of other people would have died by, because of nuclear fallout. That's the technology that we have compared to the technology that killed over 60 million people uh, in the Second World War. One of the great glories is that we've held that, we've, we've held off that war. And I think probably the highest, most moral, most ethical thing we can try to do is keep the peace with China. Keep the peace with Russia. It doesn't mean we're weak. In fact, maybe the way to keep the peace is to be strong. So um, those were the mega points that my students and I discussed at the end of this three and a half month course. Are you all uplifted by this or completely <laughs> depressed? I said I was gonna end on hope. I'm gonna just, I'm now gonna speed through a couple of slides just so we can come back to them. If any of you have questions on Europe, um, here is what I think and my students think is happening in Europe. Or do they have challenges? They've got their second largest economy, their strongest military, and by far their most globally oriented country on the way out the door, maybe. We talked at dinner as well about the fact that Brits are now having serious second thoughts, so much so that the probability of a second referendum has risen just in the last 30 days because the EU won't give and Theresa May's government can't provide a path towards a separation that makes sense. We've talked about populism, the extraordinary influx of refugees. In the autumn of 2015, 1.5 million people walked into Europe after a perilous journey across the Eastern Aegean or the Mediterranean Sea, that's changed politics. They have terrorism from within. The terrorist threat in Europe is far greater than the terrorist threat in the United States. We've talked about Putin preying on countries to the east. We've got to contain him there. Um, and the Europeans feel that the United States, for the first time in seven decades, is no longer there for them. President Trump went to Europe in July. He said the European Union is a foe of the United States. No American president since Truman, including Truman, had ever said that. And I'm a former ambassador to NATO for a Republican president, George W. Bush. We've never had an American president question the NATO alliance, Turkey, major authoritarian challenge. So if you want to talk about Europe, we can talk about Europe. I think what this means is the Europeans are going to be inward looking and focusing. They have to be. They have to work on their problems structurally to get through this incredible agenda. If you're Angela Merkel and you wake up to this every morning and she's even losing 
political power. Unfortunately, I have great admiration for her. I think she's kind of held the West together uh, during the, both the Obama and Trump administrations, by the way. She's been the strongest leader. This is a big, big task for the Europeans. In the Middle East, remember how you felt January, February, March of 2011? Remember the so-called inaptly named Arab Spring? Um, boy, what's the report card seven and a half years later? It's not good. Analytically speaking, here's what my students and I thought. Almost every Arab country is worse off. There are 22 Arab countries. You could make a case that Morocco and Tunisia, Morocco, because the king devolved some power to his cabinet, gave the people a greater say in a, in a monarchy. Tunisia, because it's really inventive, creative, hybrid government, they have Islamists, and, de and small d Democrats and the secular Democrats in the same government, they might be slightly better off. Everybody else, starting with the Keystone State Euro uh, Egypt, worse off. And, the, and it does get worse because four of these states, let me see if the, uh, let me see if the laser works. Libya is a failed state. Five tribes contesting for power. And they can't, the government can't control the borders or the streets. It's mayhem. Yemen, we should be reading about Yemen every day in the newspapers. It's the most vicious civil war, fueled by the Saudis and Emiratis on one side, the great Sunni powers, against the great Shia power, Iran, supporting the Houthi rebels. Worst cholera outbreak in recent years, Yemen. Famine, Yemen. The Saudis and Emiratis bombing civilian cities just to terrorize the people, and these are our friends by the way, and we've supplied most of the military hardware. This is a tough challenge if you're in the Trump administration. Do you cut them off? Do you not cut them off? So Yemen's a mess. We know a lot about um, Iraq, uh, excuse me, because we've been in Iraq for the last uh, 15 years. Iraq's still pretty much divided between a Shia-dominated part of the South, Basra and Baghdad. Iran has more influence in Iraq than we do. And that pains me to say that after we lost 4,500 American troops there and 30,000 Americans wounded and all the Iraqis killed and wounded in those terrible battles. You remember them uh, after 2003. And then of course the Kurds, semi-autonomous, wishing to get out, but they really can't. And the unresolved nature of Anbar, the Sunni areas where the US Marines in the surge in 2006 and seven did a great job of pacifying this part of Iraq then the Islamic State came in. And we're just finishing our battle against the Islamic State that President Obama and President Trump have been waging. And the last failed state is this state. Look at this state. Its neighbors are Israel, Jordan, Iraq, uh, Turkey, and Lebanon. So it's a keystone state. The pre-war population of Syria was 22.4 million people. Remember that figure. Over 12 million of them are homeless. So in a population of 22.4 million people, more than half the people are homeless. They've been blasted out of their homes by the Russian Air Force, the Syrian Air Force, or some ethnic tribally based terrorist group because they're the wrong religion. So about 7 million people of them are homeless inside the country. They're just on the run. They're in refugee camps. They're just trying to hold on and not lose their families until the war ends. 5 million outside the country. In Lebanon, the Syrian refugee population is so great that one of every two school children in Lebanon is a Syrian refugee kid. In Jordan, the country can barely cope with the pressure from the Syrian refugee population, these poor refugees, just trying to save themselves. And more than a million in Germany, in Sweden, in Austria, in France, in the Netherlands. Here's one more data point. I'm into data. In every previous refugee crisis since 1945, the United States of America has taken half the refugees. It's surprising, isn't it? I didn't know that until we did the research. Half the refugees, why? We're 3,000 miles across. We're 1,800 miles deep, and we're an immigrant nation. I think if we went around the room, if you're not Native American, um, or if you're not African American, who ancestors were brought here in chains, the rest of our grandparents and great grandparents and ancestors came here willingly. They're immigrants. That's why we took, in every refugee crisis since 1945, half the refugees to be resettled. 
Germany's taken more than a million Syrian refugees. France has taken 75,000. Canada, Prime Minister, has taken more than 50,000 Syrian refugees. You know how many we've taken? 312. Yeah. Something like that. I've lost count. It's somewhere in that region. It's the worst refugee crisis since 1945. There are 63 million refugees and internally placed people in the world today, and we've basically shut our doors for the first time at a time of unrivaled wealth and prosperity. We're below 4% unemployment, where if you do the numbers, immigrants actually strengthen our economy. They don't sap the economy, they create businesses. Or in the case of Silicon Valley or the biotech community in Boston, they actually do the work that we need to have done. So boy, do we have a lot to think about when we look at the Middle East, and I've said a lot about it, uh, and we can come back to it if you'd like. Last map that my students and I looked at really intensively was this map. Boy, what an interesting map this is. This is the power map of the future. I showed you the Europe map. Robert Kaplan, the American strategist who sometimes comes to talk to my students, um, he wrote a great book called Monsoon in 2011. He talked about this world. He said, Europe, he said, think of Europe as the dominant global economy, the dominant military sphere of the last 500 years. You think about the Mediterranean and Western Europe. That's where the power was. Spanish Empire, Portuguese Empire, Napoleon's Empire, the 150 years of Britain's extraordinary global empire, the union with the United States in World War II, and then the creation of NATO, which extends Europe as a global power to our time. Kaplan says, it's all about to change. He said, that European map that we looked at, that's the power map of the last 500 years. This is the power map of 2030, 2040, 2050. A couple of data points. The four strongest economies in the world in the next 50 years will all be on this map. India, China, Japan, and the United States. We're a Pacific power. In fact, our biggest state, our most successful state, the heart of our startup tech economy is California, and Washington and Oregon contributing to it. Four strongest military powers in the world. The next 20, 30, 40 years will be those four countries. So Kaplan says, this is the power map. Think of it also this way. 50% of the oil and gas in the world is produced here. It's shipped out of the Strait of Hormuz and the Bab el Mandeb, across the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, then through the most important choke point of the world, the Strait of Malacca, up to the big Asian economies, China, India, Japan, South Korea, Indonesia. 60% of the container traffic in the world swings west, east, east, west in this incredible area. This is the power map of the next couple of decades, and we Americans, have, we're going to be centrally involved, and centrally involved in some big power competitions, like this one. The way to think, I think about our relationship with China, China's going to be our most important partner. You want to do something on climate change? You need China. You want to do something to stabilize the global economy? We're the first number one and number two global economies. China has enormous capacity, so in a lot of ways, we should not think of China as we thought about the Soviet Union under Stalin and Khrushchev's time. It's, we can't contain China. We're fundamentally integrated with China. Our economy is, and our society is. But here's the problem. Our most important partner is going to be China, and our most important competitor over here is going to be China. Because at the same time that we trade and do things with China, they're trying to push us out. They're trying to push us off this map. They want the Americans out. They want to return after two centuries of humiliation, where they've been kept down, to their rightful place. Read Xi Jinping's speech. It's all there in black and white in his speech. And he means what he says. And the enormous sums that they're putting into quantum computing and AI into their blue water navy. It's all meant to negate the advantages of the American fleet and air power based in Japan and South Korea and Australia 
and to push us beyond what the Chinese say is a second island chain, way out in the Pacific, past Guam. That's a big competition, and we're in right in the middle of it right now. We need a productive relationship, but we're going to compete. We've got North Korea. Lisa, let, me, let me say something nice about President Trump. I was really worried in his first nine or ten months as president that we might get into a war with North Korea. I couldn't see the rationale for a war. If you've ever been up to the DMZ, most heavily mined place on earth, this could be really dangerous. A lot of people could have been killed. I think his return to diplomacy is smart. I think he's done pretty well. I don't think Singapore amounted to much, but that's okay. It's the first round of a 22-round boxing match with Kim Jong-un. And the president was right to do it. He has a very able Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, an able Secretary of Defense and Jim Mattis. These two guys are very good, very strong, so let's hope the president succeeds. It's going to be tough on North Korea. We've given away some of our leverage. We can come back to that. Um, this is Kaplan's thesis that we talked about. I haven't talked about this. Let me just say one word about it. If we're looking for friends and allies, they're in two of those four dominant Indo-Pacific countries. India wants a strategic relationship with the United States because India fears China. And India has a very long border with China, and China's been punching holes in it to humiliate the Indians. And one of George W. Bush's great achievements, which President Obama and President Trump have, have followed through on, is to create a military strategic relationship between India and the United States and Japan, India, and the United States. And think of those three countries. They can't contain China, but they can manage China. And they can prevent China from seeking to seeking the power that they want in Asia in the future. So that, I think, is the most important strategic step we have taken in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and that's the great game for power in the Indo-Pacific. On one belt road and one road, and we have a very smart guy in the audience, and I just saw him here, is David Lipton, who is an old friend of mine from the Clinton administration. De David is the deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund. Um, any tough economic questions, I'm now going to send right over to David, who's sitting in the third row. Um, two data points on, on the Belt Road Initiative, which you've all heard about. The ambition of China in unleashing this Belt Road Initiative is just extraordinary. 66 priority countries. They're on the receiving end of infrastructure development, of capital. And let me just tell you how big it is. In 2018 dollars, 2018 dollars, the Marshall Fund, seven decades later, is about $190 billion. That's what we spent between June 1947 and the mid-1950s to lift Europe and the Middle East back up. The Belt Road Initiative is already over a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars in Chinese capital outlays, state companies, private companies, the government. This is a not just Chinese um, being nice to people. It's China seeking power through capital investment through infrastructure projects, through owning the port uh, in Sri Lanka. I was in Greece last October, and I went down to the port of Piraeus. Guess who manages the port of Piraeus? China, Chinese state company. So it's smart, it's strategic, it's a big move. We have no corresponding move. We've not done anything like this in the last 40 to 50 years. I'd be interested if we get questions on this, what David Lipton thinks about it. Okay, to come to an end, there's this place called North America. In a lot of ways, and David Petraeus might have mentioned it last week, this is our power base. China and Russia have neighbors who fear it. India has neighbors who want to kill it. The United States has the two best neighbors in the history of the superpower competition. These countries tolerate us. They even like us on odd days. Um, we are linked economically. Together, the three of us are the greatest energy power in the world. Think of it another way. We're as strong here in Nantucket on counterterrorism as the Canadian borders and the Mexican borders. Our fate is linked with these two countries. And I'm not just preaching to the choir because a former prime minister of Canada is in the audience. I believe it. And the worst thing we can do 
is disrespect them. We did that with the, with the Mexicans at the very start of the Trump campaign. Liars, rapists, and thieves. And then earlier this summer, when the nicest prime minister since Prime Minister Joe Clark, <laughs> Justin Trudeau, was disrespected in a big way. We were just chatting, I'll just say my end of the conversation beforehand. There's a little rule in diplomacy. You can argue all you want behind the scenes, and we do. But when you're allies, we treat each other respectfully publicly. And the president crossed that line, and boy, even the Canadians who tolerate us got upset, and I can understand why. This is our power base. And so as I think of our position responding to the megatrends, to what's happening in Europe, and the Middle East, and the Indo-Pacific, here are the questions I have. I'm worried. I'm worried about what made us great, that we're giving it away. Questions. We have driven this international system, sometimes, sometimes unwisely, but mostly successfully since the end of the Second World War. We've done a really good job of keeping the world out of war, of elevating the global economy, of keeping our doors open to manage immigration. I don't think we believe that's our job anymore, but that's been our job for the last 73 years. We're drifting away from our alliances in Europe and in Asia. Look at the way the president treated NATO uh, this summer. Um, we've talked about what we're doing in terms of these NAFTA negotiations. We have no trade policy that I can figure out. And again, David would have a really good view in this because David is a thousand times smarter than I am on economic issues. But you know, we had Trans-Pacific Partnership, 40% of global GDP, our big power move against China, and we gave it away in January 2017. The free trade agreement between the two biggest economies, Europe and America, gave that away. NAFTA, who knows where it's going. And now we have trade battles seemingly with the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Chinese, the Europeans, the Canadians, and the Mexicans simultaneously. And a lot of those countries would support us in our, the real trade battle against China, but not if we're inflicting uh, trade sanctions against them. And we've talked about this. What made us great, in my judgment, every Republican president and Democratic president for seven decades was, we believe in our alliances, and they strengthen us. Russia and China have no allies. We believe in free trade, because that lifts a lot of boats. We believed in legal managed immigration, keeping the doors open to keep us young, and therefore more productive as a country. And we certainly believe in supporting democracy when it's at risk. And suddenly, if, those were, if that's the foundation of American power, I fear we're giving it away. I'm worried, very worried about our geopolitical position right now. And are we going to lead? Or are we already in retreat? This is a serious question. I'm testifying twice in the, before the two Senate committees in the next 30 days. These are Republicans calling the hearings. They're worried. The Republican committee chairs, armed services, banking, foreign relations, they know what made us great. So it's up to us as citizens to remember it, to say it, to believe it, and to support what made us great. Boy, have I depressed all of you. I'm looking at these faces like, where'd this guy come from? So a couple of years ago, true story, Libby came to a lecture like this at Harvard, and we were walking home, and I said, how did that go? And there was a pause. She said, you're depressing everybody. <laughs> and she asked a really good question. I took it seriously. She said, okay, I get something like, I get that the world is full of mayhem and division and problems. What are you hopeful about? I took it seriously. So every time I teach now, I poll the class at the end of the semester. Don't tell me what you wish for, but tell me analytically, where are the hopeful global trends? Let me end on this. The hopeful global trends. This is my class, May 2018. We have lifted, we the human race, more people out of poverty in the last 30 years than at any time in human history. China, India, Brazil, the Caribbean, historic movement of people from abject poverty uh, to the global middle class. That's to be hopeful about. We have not eradicated a global disease since smallpox. We are just about to eradicate polio in the next three to five years. And I think it now exists in Pakistan, Afghanistan, 
uh, Nigeria, but only just isolated villages. And there's an outbreak in Damascus that has been dealt with. We can eradicate polio. Bill Gates thinks that malaria can be eradicated in his lifetime. He's in his mid-60s. Last year, about half a million young kids died from malaria. You could say, we could save all those lives. That's hopeful. They're hopeful about my millennial students, the growing global economy. They're hopeful about what a lot of you, you including the sponsor of this lecture, have been involved in, the virtuous nexus between technology and venture capital and private equity. This incredible technological growth has been produced by a lot of you on the financial end, a lot of you on the technological end. My students believe in that. Last thing I'll say is this. Churchill, who had a lot of the good quotes, came to Harvard September 1943. That was an interesting point in history. Um, we had The British had stopped Rommel at El Alamein. The Soviets had stopped the German Sixth Army at von Paulus at Stalingrad. We had invaded Sicily and were starting the invasion of Italy. The Allied forces were going to win the war. Britain was kind of, in a metaphorical way, handing the baton of leadership to the United States because we'd fueled the war effort, our incredible economy and our incredible soldiers. And we were becoming the greatest power in about September 1943. And Churchill gave a speech to the Harvard students, and here's what he said. He said, you want to be great. You want to exert authority in the world. The price of greatness is responsibility. You want to lead? You can't retreat. You can't describe yourself as a victim. We're not victims. You have to lead other people to do great things in the world and stop the negative forces in the world. Boy, that Churchill quote really, for me, summarizes us. We should want to play a great role in the world because we have awesome power, but we can't if we're in retreat. So that's my hopeful Churchill quote. Thank you very much for listening. So it took me longer to get through the slot, the three and a half months of the course than I thought, but we have plenty of time for questions. I'll just call on people, just maybe identify yourself, I'll repeat the question. Um, I'm Steve Perlman. Um, my question has to do with, do you think this country has the political will to do many of the things you talked about? I mean, that you're testifying before some Senate committees, but what will come of that? Steve Perlman asked, do we have the political will to achieve, can I paraphrase, this agenda, or do we not? And I think it does come down to this. We've got the economic, political, and military capacity to lead. In fact, the world wants us to lead. They don't trust most of the world, the Chinese and Russians. They trust us. I think it comes down to leadership. And I would say, let me try to be an equal opportunity critic here, because I didn't want this to descend into partisanship. I'm troubled, I will just say this, by many of our figures on the Democratic Party left, the left of the Democratic Party, who basically are saying can't afford to lead, too many problems at home, reduce the size of the military, too many entanglements overseas. Um, that's what Bernie Sanders was saying throughout the 2016 campaign. Very much an isolationist message. We're definitely hearing that on the far right of the Republican uh, Party as well. We're hearing it from President Trump. Let me just say it. We're hearing it from President Trump. We're not hearing it from Mitch McConnell, or Paul Ryan, or Bob Corker, or many of the Republicans who chair the big committees in the Senate and House. They're with the president in the tax bill and on the economic agenda. They're not necessarily with them on Russia, or on China, or the lack of R&D spending. You talk to them. They're giving speeches. They're calling people up and calling hearings against the president. So I think it's about leadership in both parties, and I think both parties have a leadership problem. Will there, will there be Democrats who emerge to contest the 2020 presidential election who can talk to the great mass of the American people? We are somewhere in the middle, most Americans. In the middle of the spectrum, or center right, or center left. There are a lot of people on the far left and far right, but that's not the majority. 
So that's what I'm looking for as a citizen, somebody in the middle. I actually don't care what party they're from. But it's a leadership question because it's difficult to make the argument after 73 years of a global peace to the American public, we ought to spend $700 billion a year on defense. That's what we spend. We're gonna have a budget deficit of a trillion dollars because of the tax cuts. And so, boy, the next two or three presidents are gonna to have to be, they're gonna to have to have, they have an impossible job. How do we keep ourselves strong and yet not go bankrupt? But that's why we elect people to make good choices. And so, Steve, that's how I'd answer your question. Leadership, sensible leadership. I mean, we got so lucky with Harry Truman and Eisenhower and Reagan and Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton and Barack Obama and, and they, all of them. They all kind of believed it. They didn't kind of, they believed in this. And suddenly we have a president who does not believe in this. And I know some of you may be his supporters. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. But my analytical view of the president, he doesn't believe in this. He believes in America first, transactional politics, no allies. Allies don't count anymore. And I think that's the road for America to lose its competitive um, edge. Yes, sir. So, um, I was at a lecture uh, with the, I think, agent in charge in Boston for the FBI. And uh, he was talking about the Russia investigation, uh, not with respect to Trump, but with respect to Russian meddling in the 2016 election. And a comment from someone in the field was, don't we do the same thing? Um, can you talk a little bit about your view of American exceptionalism and, and what it is that we need to do? So the question is um, a comment you were talking to an FBI person and the question and, and about me the Russian meddling in our election. Don't we do the same thing? No. Have we interfered in other countries' elections since the Second World War? Yes. Have we interfered in a massive scale against a competitor nation like this in a way that seeks to destabilize them? Not in my personal memory. I started with the government in June 1980 as an intern. Go all the way, all the way back. If you listen to the Republican chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, Richard Burr of North Carolina, who worked very closely with the Democratic vice chair, Mark Warner, senator from Virginia, they issued a report six weeks ago that said, and this is a Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, working through the FBI. They said there's no question the Russians made a serious attempt to do two things. They got into the databases of 23 of our state's electoral systems. There's no evidence they manipulated the votes. There's no evidence they turned it, they actually produced a Trump victory. There's no evidence that I've seen. But they got into the systems. They showed they could do it. Second, they flooded social media with millions of bits of false information, fake news, designed to confuse Trump supporters, Clinton supporters, Sanders supporters. They tried to manipulate the election. That's a national emergency. The Senate voted 98 to 2 to, to impose sanctions. That committee led it. At the end of 2017 against the Russians, it took the president six months to implement the sanctions because he wants to be friends with Putin. David and I were part of the Clinton team that reached out to the Russians and Ukrainians after the end of the Cold War. One of the lessons I learned is, especially with Putin, when he came along is, the way to work with Putin is to be strong with Putin. George W. Bush was strong with Putin. I'm not sure President Obama ever matched that. But President Trump, I think, is, has got this idea I can be buddies with him and therefore I can't do anything that would hurt his feelings. We need to hurt his feelings. Because he's the kind of guy who will take everything unless you just construct the brick wall and say, no, I'm stronger than you. And I don't think the president has done that. And a lot of Republicans on the Hill, Capitol Hill, don't think he's done it either. Questions from this part of the room? or this part of the room. Yes, sir. The question is, one of the mega trends that we didn't see on the first slide was climate change. Climate. Progress for all the other mega trends. I was wondering if you could comment on political will to truly do something about it, and what you think the impact might be on those other trends. So the question was about climate change. Do we have political will in the United States and, and internationally to do something about it. The leadership has come from Europe and Japan over the last 30 years. The two largest carbon emitters for a long time, China and the United States, didn't want to do anything. It was this extraordinary joint venture between Barack Obama and Xi Jinping in 2014 and 15 
that gave, along with Europe and Japan, Canada, that allowed us to produce the Paris Accords. The Paris Accords are very weak. Uh, they're not strong enough, Most, I think John Holdren probably told you, to make a big difference. But at least it was the first time we had every country in the world in the same boat, saying, we all are in the same boat, by the way. We're going to sink or swim based on what we do together. And that political unity was very important. So when we pulled out, when President Trump pulled us out, as I traveled around the world in Asia, as well as in Europe, it's probably the single Canada, probably the single greatest thing we've done that has lowered our credibility in the world because people look at us and say, wait a minute, you're the largest global economy. You produced a lot of these carbon emissions over the last hundred years. The Industrial Revolution, the 19th, early 20th century. You're now saying you're not gonna do anything to help the rest of us. And you talk to someone from an island state that might disappear because of climate change. So I think it's really hurt our credibility. It's been very unwise. And I think whoever succeeds President Trump, Republican or Democrat, will reverse it. Now, we're still going to have to argue, how do you transition from our current economy to a clean economy? It's going to be incredibly expensive. It might drive a lot of people out of work. And so this is not easy, but you've got to start walking down the road. And we were walking down the road, and now we've reversed course. And for the leading climate change problem country, in the eyes of the rest of the world, to say no, that's a big hit. And it's the wrong thing for us to do, in my, in my judgment. As father of three daughters, I'm looking for women to call on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where do you set um, our rule of law? I think the U.S. is, I think that's a blessing in disguise, particularly in this um, technology. Because I think that we as patent laws are unique in that regard to other countries. And the fact that an individual can create something and keep the economic yeah. benefit of that. So the question. Yeah, the question is where the rule of law, and you're thinking about the trade patents, the arguments with China on intellectual property rights, and you know, I think I I might just hand the neighbor the microphone to David in a minute on this. I think um, this is the thing: the greatest trade threat we face is China, because China has violated the rules of intellectual property, and China has ripped off what is most valuable to most of our leading tech companies, that is patents, creations, intellectual creations. And the proper way to fight that war would be to get the Japanese, the South Koreans, and the EU behind us. Rather than create trade wars with all of them simultaneously, we've lost our leverage with the Chinese. And again, I think that a next president of either party would probably go in that direction and use the leverage we have. That's what the Trans-Pacific Partnership was all about. 40% of, of global GDP in one virtuous 12-country trade regime. The two largest problems in the international trade system, China and India, are kept outside of TPP, and the only way they could get in would be to start playing by the rules. And we gave that away um, a year and a half ago. Big own goal um, by the United States. And I think there are a lot of Republicans who regret that and he'll want to see it reversed. But the president's got his own views on trade, and, and um, he's not going to go in that direction as long as he's president. I think that's pretty clear. Thank you. Yes? Uh, speaking of rule of law and Europe, um, how, do you, how does privacy, personal privacy, how do you see that working with technological innovation, hegemony, um, what Europe is doing? Well, the EU is now passed, has, has already passed laws. <laughs> Um, in the U.S. That affect... Um, no, no, I mean, how do you see this evolving in the... In our society. How do I see the privacy issue evolving? It's going to be a major issue, not just in terms of government policy, but how we deal with each other, um, the power of our tech companies. Uh, there's already been a reaction to Facebook and the misguided policies of Facebook that let the Russians manipulate our system. To give you, to give you one example, I think it's going to be a major issue in our society, but legally, the European Union has now passed much more restrictive laws that are having an impact on citizens and our companies. So it's a space where we're going to need to play and make some difficult, difficult decisions. Do you think it should evolve legislatively or should it, will it go through the courts? 
I think it was certainly going to be, is certainly being contested in the courts. Whether Congress deals with it or not, it's going to be interesting to see. I think there's probably a greater chance of that happening if there's democratic control of one house, I would think. It's clearly not part of the current agenda of the, do of the dominant party, the majority party in the House and Senate. Yes, sir. Professor Burns, when you listed the uh, countries that had the tariff problem, you didn't mention Turkey. It's hard to keep up with it. <laughs> and uh, you were ambassador to the, uh, the NATO. Tell yeah. us what that dispute means with respect to NATO and danger to NATO. This is tough. Um, you know, we have 29 NATO countries, um, Canada, the United States, and 27 Europeans. Turkey's been a member since 1959. Turkey actually has the second largest military inside NATO. It's now an authoritarian government. Over the last 10 years, Erdogan has basically stripped the court system and stripped the parliament of most of the power that the opposition had or independent people in the courts had. And he's become an authoritarian ruler particularly since the coup attempt in July of 2016, where he nearly lost his life, he's been out for blood. Um, and it's hard, it's very difficult for us to have an authoritarian country in the middle of NATO, because we're not just a military alliance, we're an alliance of democracies. We stand for something. On 9-11, I was a very new American ambassador to NATO. I'd been there for 12 days. And within a couple of hours of the attack, David Wright, the Canadian ambassador Prime Minister I'm sure knows him, came to me and said, have you thought about invoking Article 5 of the NATO Treaty? I don't know if you all know what that is. The Article 5 is the keystone of the NATO Treaty. An attack on one of us shall be considered an attack on all of us. That was to deter the Soviets from attacking a small country in Europe in the 50s and 60s and 70s, because we would, the Canadians and Americans would come across the pond for the third time in the century to defend them. And it worked. The huge irony was, we always thought, Truman and Eisenhower and even Reagan thought, if Article 5 ever had to be invoked, it would be the United States and Canada going to Europe. This time it was all the allies coming to us. And when Ambassador Wright said, have you thought about invoking Article 5, I called my friend Condoleezza Rice. It was 4 in the morning, Washington time on the, on the 12th of September, the next morning. And I said, Condi, the allies want to invoke Article 5. They want to go to war with us. She said, go for it. I said, but I'm calling you because I need the president's personal authority because they all want to go to war with us. She said, go for it. I said, but I really feel that the president needs to instruct me. She said, the president had a really bad day. It's four in the morning. I'm the national security advisor. Go for it. <laughs> I said, yes. So we went for it. Here's the value of alliances. It's not just rhetoric. All those countries went into Afghanistan with us. They're all there 17 years later. More than 1,000 of them lost their lives. Our losses are about 2,600 American soldiers in Afghanistan, men and women. 1,000 European dead. The Canadians have taken on proportionally the highest number of casualties. Kandahar province, when Canada volunteered to go into the toughest province in Afghanistan. The Russians have no one willing to fight with them. The Chinese have nobody willing to fight with them. We've got these great allies, and yet our president disses them. I'm sorry to be, maybe you th if you're a Trump supporter, you may think I'm getting political here, but I'm just trying to be analytical about what's right and what's wrong. We need these allies, and that's the power differential. So it's tough to have Turkey inside going authoritarian. We will wait them out. At some point, the curve will be reversed and the Turks will come back to some kind of semblance of democracy. He's not going to live forever. And the Turkish people don't want to live in dictatorship. We're just going to have to handle them until that, until that happens. Yes, sir. What you're describing suggests very clearly that to rebuild diplomacy will take skill. And I'm concerned that Diplomatic Corps has been hollowed out Me too. in a few years. Me too. So the question is, aren't we going to need a lot of dip diplomats to deal with this? Yes. Is the State Department being hollowed out? Yes. Data points. There are 8,000 American diplomats. We have about 2.5 million people in uniform, and thank goodness we do. They're great people. About 8,000 people. If you're a military person, that's two heavy brigades. General Petraeus would put it in those terms. We can't have a diplomatic corps with an 
cut in personnel, which is what the president wants, or a 30% cut in budget, which is what the president wants. Because most of these problems, by the way, are not going to be resolved by the 82nd Airborne or the 1st Marine Division. You know, climate change, trafficking of women and children, pandemics, putting together coalitions to stop wars, it's all done by diplomats. And so if you cut the budget by 30%, you get what we've had in the last year and a half. The greatest excess of ambassadorial level diplomats in the history of the last 100 years is the last uh, 18 months. The great, we, had, we usually take in about 700 junior officers a year. This year, we're going to take on in 301. So we'll see that gap 10 or 15 years from now. When we need people with real capacity in their late 30s, early 40s, they won't be there because we didn't hire them in 2018. And I, I have some hope that Secretary Pompeo might reverse this. He's a good man. I don't always agree with him on issues, but I think he's got a good background. He's an institution builder. He's pledged to reverse it. Let's see, but the budget right now from OMB would be a 30% budget cut. Very unwise. One of the smartest people I ever worked for was Colin Powell, 35 years in the Army. And when he was Secretary of State, I reported to him when I was Ambassador to NATO. He used to say to us, he'd say, look, the proper way to think about America's assets is we push our diplomats out front and we keep our military in the reserve. And even in 2003, he was saying to us, we've kind of reversed that. We've been pushing the military out front and we haven't used the diplomats enough, smart man. And a lot of our, my military brethren, active duty and retired, are the biggest supporters of the State Department because they know they've got a job to do and they know that they can't do our job especially with a 30% budget cut. Thank you for letting me get on my soapbox. <laughs> yes, sir. One more question. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for joining us tonight. Quick question about Venezuela and every, all the turmoil that's going on there, and they have a lot of oil. Just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, one of the least... Uh, the question is about Venezuela. There's a lot of oil in Venezuela. True. It's probably one of the two or three most unstable countries in the world right now. There's been a mass exodus of a lot of Ven Venezuelans who are productive in international business. They can't live there anymore. The left-wing dictatorship has driven them out. They've driven the country in the ground. They've driven their oil industry in the ground. And the democratic opposition rose up, and the government used anti-democratic means to smash them down. So it may be one of those things that only time can take care of, you know? Um, we've got to use our moral influence and economic influence to try to, I think, impinge on the government, use a leverage against them as much as we can. There's no way we should use military force. Nothing good. It would just help the government if we threaten them militarily as the president did in his first months in office. I think he's reconsidered that. But unfortunately, if you think about our hemisphere, I didn't cover Latin America or Africa. Trend lines are good in our hemisphere. Growth rates are up in Colombia. We have market economies and functioning democracies in Argentina, Chile, Peru, Colombia, Panama, Mexico, Canada, the United States. I'm just thinking about the Western Hemisphere right now. The Castro brothers are gone. Um, the Nicaraguan dictatorship of the left, Ortega, is on the ropes as we speak. The people might overthrow him. The Latin Americans are coming forward for democracy and for market capitalism. Our big problem is really not Mexico, it's Central America. It's countries with no economies, mass export of kids to come to our borders. A lot of the people seeking asylum are not from Mexico on our southern border, they're from Nicaragua and El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras. And, and, and the only way that we can stabilize our own borders to help stabilize them in their own countries is called economic aid and diplomacy. Again, coming back to your question. So um, there's a lot to hope for. In Africa, three years ago, six of the 10 fastest growing countries in the world were sub-Saharan African countries. Africa's coming into its own. So it's interesting when you hang around with millennials, um, they tend to be a little bit more hopeful maybe than people of an advanced age like myself. <laughs> and they keep us honest analytically. Look at the data, look at the numbers. David works in this every day. I never gave you the mic. Um, but if you want to talk to a really smart person, it's the guy in the yellow shirt right there, <laughs> David Lipton. Um, pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much.